Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Joel Cruzwick. He is the public sector CTO at GitLab. Joel, good to have you with us. Thank you so much, Tom. And our general topic is modernization for state and local government levels, and that takes so many forms. And let's begin with what it actually means in the state and local context. Well, it's one of those words, right? How do you define something in that broad of a spectrum? And essentially, we're just looking at what comes next, right? Let's simplify it down to what comes next. When we talk about modernization uh, and we talk about it from the state and local perspective specifically, uh, some of the things we're seeing are just the migration into different languages and in, in, in applications. We're seeing a, a little less of the, the mainframe world, right? And trying to figure out, well, how do we get that world into the cloud? Um, we're looking at some of the things that have happened the last few years, right? Some really dramatic events in the world, of course. Well, how does that apply to state and local governments? They've seen new loads and, and, and impacts they've never seen before. And so uh, the thoughts of modernization now, we step back and we say, well, now, wait a minute. What does it look like to modernize for today versus what maybe we would have thought modernization was in 2019? Sure. So the idea of serving both your clients better with some of the modern digital systems and what they're capable of, but increasingly making sure your employees have good experience because they may not be in the office and it's the terminal mainframe model that's gone really for good. Yeah, that's what we're starting to see, right? Uh, it's it's uh, it's still hanging on. It's it's hanging on pretty well, in fact. But yeah, more and more, it's it's a question of well, where are your workers, right? And and what do they know? Uh, and and living on technology that's sixty years old, even if we've kept up with it, there's still a question of well, who knows how to interface with that equipment to get what we need for today's you know modern applications. And systems do age, they get old, they get obsolete, but often they keep on working. And so they become kind of in that old reliable category. Therefore, what are the big risks that state and local agencies face as they try to get into the new coding systems and the new digital services? Well, I'll give you one, one distinct example from a recent conversation I had where somebody said, well, we got all our data out of the mainframe. What do we do next? There it sits in a big pile, right? And I think one of the, the risks we have is saying, okay, we're going to start this project, but you know, like a lot of those home projects that never quite get done, we don't know necessarily, we get stuck somewhere, right? We don't know necessarily where to take this. And so as we go to move off of those existing systems, we end up in a bunch of different situations where maybe we've got service requirements. Uh, we've got you know a, a vendor lock-in issue of some kind that traps us when we, we get stuck, don't know what to do. Um, we end up with a whole bunch of tools trying to do different things that we think we need to do or, uh, you know, but put all that together, right? Put it all together. And, and what you end up with is a situation where you may be actually unintentionally opening up some new security holes within your environment. Because if you're moving to the cloud, for instance, if you're doing so with all your data first and then putting the applications on top, do you have everything set up correctly where somebody can't sneak in and grab a token and now expose all that data for you to the internet? You know, worst case scenario, we don't want to see that kind of thing. Um, we, we may or may not be actually doing the right things for a broadened attack surface, right? We've opened ourselves up in new ways. We've taken ourselves out of that secure world with the, the mainframe. And now all of a sudden, there's a lot of new attack vectors. The internet is a wild place for those who have the skills, and they would love to come after that data and do something with it. And with all of these new utilities, all of these new vulnerabilities, agencies often maybe inadvertently, but end up with a large number of tools to manage what they think they need to manage. And that tool proliferation can be kind of a danger in itself too, can it, in terms, if nothing else, for efficiency? Well, sure. Yeah. Administratively, the load, right, can get very, very interesting from the perspective of, well, who's going to administer all these? How do we make sure our role-based permissions are correct? We hear a lot about zero trust architectures these days. When you're talking about zero trust, you're talking about, I don't believe anybody is who they say they are or that they're going to do what they say they do. Well, the more tools we have, the more we stitch things together, the more opportunities there are for that model to become problematic. You're exactly right.
And let's talk about how this all looks from the citizen point of view. I think it was maybe 25 years ago that, wow, we could buy a fishing license online. A lot <laughs> of places haven't really gotten past that. And they're still downloading PDFs and mailing them in and all of this kind of mainframe or early, early, early web type of experience out there. So what are you seeing that is going well and that is at the cutting edge here at the state and local level? You know, I've got two really recent experiences of my own, uh, just very interesting interactions with different government entities, right? And from a state perspective, I moved from a, one state to another. The state I was in, there's no way they could process anything related to a license plate on their back end systems in less than six weeks. That was just the shortest they could possibly do. I, I changed states. I was forced to buy new license plates. I had them in two days. And I was floored. I thought, wow, what kind of backend systems do they have here? That is modernization. That is taking it to the next level, taking six weeks to two days. Now, that's the state level. At the local level, I had to get some permits. And would you believe my project took 10 months to get all the permitting lined up for a seven-day project, right? So we have the same problem that still persists in other areas. And it, it really does start to stand out for the civilian experience, right? What can someone as a resident of your state or of your locality expect from its government as far as services go? And it's it's becoming a bigger and bigger question uh, as, as expectations rise in the age of uh, Amazon Prime. Right. So then state and local agencies really have that single front door, single portal or no wrong front door, because at the back end, you have so many different agencies, like you say, that might impinge on a single project, putting an addition on a house or whatever. And they're, that's their big challenge. Exactly right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, what concerns the governments themselves do you find in speaking with them? Well, I think there's a number of things that are currently causing some angst, right? Number one is just people. People are moving, right? If you look at the, the demographic data right now, people are moving all over the place. And so retaining top talent is a real trick. Getting people to come back into the office in a, a post-pandemic era uh, can be really challenging. And attracting top talent and keeping it in an era of, of some pretty rampant inflation, right, has been interesting. A lot of folks are saying, I'm not getting a raise that looks like the numbers that are coming out, and they're looking elsewhere. So talent retention is a really big situation that a lot of locales are dealing with. Now, when you take that and amplify that, though, with the tool sets that people are using, right? So I get calls a lot of times for, we're trying to retain people. My first question is, what are you building and what tools are you using to build it with? So when, when we're asking those questions, what we're finding out is, well, some of my tools are from the 90s. Oh, okay. So when we're trying to attract the, the new uh, talent coming out of college, maybe some of the latest, greatest uh, technologies they've been handling and dealing with in college, and we say, I want some of those new folks to come in and, and breathe some new technology into our space. They take one look at a 25-year-old license manager or repository manager or you know something that completely lacks automation they say oh this is a career ending opportunity for me so even if we can get them in the into the environment and hire them we've actually seen people leaving after say four hours on the job saying i just won't do this i won't do it to my career and, and that's a new variable that we're dealing with all right and uh, what about the residents themselves i mean they have to face those constituents you know, either directly or indirectly at the ballot box. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, today it hasn't been so much an issue yet, but I see it coming. Right. I, I think where we've been so far is kind of interesting because all we do is we expect less. Right? <laughs> what do you hear people say? Oh, I got to go to the to get my license renewed. I got to go to the BMV. I got to go get a permit. Oh, I got to go to the county building. Right. We're starting to see some of that change, though, especially with some of the mandates that are coming from the federal side. If the expectation is that we'll be able to get a passport online, the expectation will probably also be looking like, well, I just need to get a permit for construction. Why can't I do that online? Right. And that civilian expectation will start to shift. And that dissatisfaction will definitely become more of an issue going forward. 
And let's talk briefly about the federal government, which has its own modernization gambits going on a variety of fronts. Is there anything that state and local can learn or glean from the federal experience? I believe so. I think as the modernization efforts continue to grow, what we're going to see is some of those same needs come into play. There's going to be needs for more and more automation. There's going to be needs for more and more focus on security over time. You know, in if we're locked up behind closed doors and nobody can get to our data, that's one thing. But again, if we're modernizing our technologies and our applications, we're opening new windows to new threats. And we want to make sure that we follow all the zero trust guidelines and the scanning guidelines that are pouring forth today on the federal side, because that, you know, the next step of that, of course, comes right into state and local. And since so many programs that originate with federal dollars are actually administered at the state and local level, sometimes at the county level, it seems like there's an opportunity for anti-fraud programs, better financial controls, and better customer experience to be actually effectuated by the state and local and county level that then feeds back to the federal, which is maybe paying for it, but not administering it directly. Absolutely right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, because when you think about it, a lot of times it's chalked up to complacency, right? Like, oh, we're you're good enough. I see why my experience is what it is. The reality is I think a lot of us just don't necessarily know where to go next, right? And so some of these mandates coming at us, like, well, what do we do with this stuff, right? We've been doing things this way for a long time. How do I go to the next level? And, and I have a great example of a recent um, uh, time that we've been at an event, right? So we went to an event not long ago. And at that event, we were asked a lot of questions about DevOps and, and security and, and what does this mean for my environment and how should I apply this? And somebody from one county over in Ohio stands up and says, hey, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of mobile apps and this has really been good for us. Our citizens love us and get their permit updates online right on their phone. Right. Here comes the group of people all flocking to this person saying, how did you get there? What did you do? Right. So those who are blazing the trail, I think, are going to get a lot of attention from the rest of us saying, wait a minute, we want to do that. That, you know, it's not that we don't want it. It's just it's a, not an easy journey to get there. Right. All right. Well, maybe from this discussion, they'll begin that journey. And we want to thank today's guest, Joel Kruiswick. He's the public sector CTO at GitLab. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. And I'm Tom Temin. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search GitLab.